Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to go ahead and find a seat, we will get started tonight. We're going to start this evening with our uh, public hearing on our annual on our annual report. Um, this presentation will be given by Dr. Hines. At the conclusion of his presentation, there'll be an opportunity uh, for public comment specifically about uh, the annual report. Uh, at the conclusion of this, we'll we'll move into the regularly scheduled board meeting and um, and go through all the posted agenda items. So this time, we'll turn it over to Dr. Chris Hines. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, tonight's presentation is a an overview of the. 2018-2019 uh, Annual Performance Report. The Annual Performance Report, which will be a, which is already available in its entirety on our website, um, the Annual Performance Report is actually a compilation of several different reports and documents, which include the following. It includes the Texas Academic Performance Report, or the TAPER. Uh, it also includes, which includes the District Bilingual ESOL Report. Uh, it also includes the PEAMS Financial Standards Report for 2017 and 18. Uh, the 1819 report is going to be released later in the spring from the state, and then we'll put it up at that time. The campus performance objectives, which are the campus improvement plans and the district improvement plan. The report on violent or criminal incidents, including our policies and procedures for violence intervention. The report on graduates enrolled in Texas institutions of higher education, which includes student enrollment and academic performance at these institutions. Uh, also included will be the district's rating from the state last year. Uh, we will have some of the statistics from the taper report. Um, given the magnitude of all these reports, we could be up here about three days presenting it all, so we're going to just pick some highlights uh, for your uh, viewing pleasure. Um, so we'll have a little bit of information. Uh, also, we have a summary of the number of counselors and librarians at each campus, which we are required to include in our annual report. Uh, first, we'll start with the rating. The district received a rating of a B, and, it, um, and for special education determination, we met requirements. Some of the information in the taper, a, look, a little bit at our current uh, trends in enrollment. And I always point out that enrollment is going to be a little bit different than actual bodies because uh, currently we have uh, half-day pre-K at most of our campuses, and so they're counted as a half, as well as any part-time students are counted as a half. When we count enrollment, we, we use whole numbers. Our current enrollment is 64,855 students, but this gives you a trend of um, the growth in enrollment over the last several years continues to be steady. This is a report that shows the 10-year enrollment trend for students with disciplinary placements. Disciplinary placements are when a student is placed in the DAEP uh, or the JJAEP. Those are uh, placements off, off of the campus site for educational purposes. And uh, again, this has been a one that we worked on over the last few years, and this is down from 2% uh, to 1% um, in the last 10 years. A little bit of a look at who makes up the student body of Conroe Independent School District. This is kind of a breakdown. Um, the district is 8.1% African American last year. Hispanic population was 36.6% of the population, 47.2% white. Um, we were 40% um, economically disadvantaged. 8.2% um, of our students were in special education. 76 were in uh, gifted and talented, just to name just a few of those areas. And again, all of this information is in the taper. Looking at that, noting that 14.2% um, of our students are English language learners. Uh, the vast majority of our students speak Spanish as a home language, but there are other languages that are represented in that count. These are just a few of the other languages that are represented at, that attend Conroe Independent Schools, um, school district schools. That includes, a, give an example, 159 students with a home language is Arabic, um, 229 students with a home language of Mandarin. I was surprised that the 166 students with the home language of Portuguese, um, 133 students home language of Russian. There are several students that, that home language is a, um, a dialect of languages spoken in India. Um, so there's quite a variety of student languages. These are just some of them. There, there are many more. There's... Uh, roughly 2,500 students that speak another language other than Spanish or English. In terms of star performance, just to, again, there's so many categories of star, we'll just hit a few of the categories. 
all students, all subjects. This is uh, how we did in terms of approaching. And, and it's also helpful to sometimes benchmark against other districts that are around us or similar to us so we can kind of see how we're doing in terms of performance. The red, red bar represents the state. The blue bar represents Conroe Independent School District and the green bars are certainly other districts um, around <coughs> us in the, in the area. So you can see how we can compare. We had 85% of our students that were approaches or above in all subjects and all grade levels. When we broke that down and looked at just our English language learners, uh, this is certainly an area that we're targeting for improvement and been working on. Uh, that number is 67% compared to the state average of 72%. Um, and again, that's an area we want to continue to work on. Another area we want to keep working on is our uh, scores with uh, special education in terms of how our students do on approaches, uh, grade level and above. And for whatever reason, the state bar didn't show up on that one, but we were above the state average on that. Economically disadvantaged student performance, again, at all subjects, all grade levels, 74% of our students uh, approached or above in, um, in how we compared to the state, which was 71%. Again, this is an area we're targeting, trying to close achievement gaps. Uh, in terms of all of our students that met or exceeded, which is um, another level up, we certainly we want our students, we don't want them to be at approaching. The district strives to have its students at met or exceeded. Uh, these represent two tests. The lighter color uh, bar represents the reading, and the darker color bar represents the math scores. Um, you can see how we, we did better than the state and compare favorably among our peer groups. In terms of all subjects at the master's level, which is the highest level of performance, again, uh, this is an area where the district does pretty well compared to the state. And again, we, we attribute that to um, solid uh, core curriculum, but it's also an area we want to keep growing. Some of the other information includes student attendance. This is our 10-year trend. Uh, last year was 96.2% attendance. You can see going back to 2009, we've, we've had a trend upwards. Uh, we'll see some bumps up and down. A lot of that reflects weather, uh, you know, weather events and other things that could impact it, how bad the flu season is. And so certainly these are all things that can impact attendance. Currently, we are at 96.3% this year so far. This is how we compare with some other districts in terms of attendance. And again, uh, certainly... We've made some improvements over the years, but it's some, certainly an area we want to continue to work on. Uh, for looking at the 2018 class of 2018 annual dropout rate, and again, there's a year delay before we get data on dropout. So this is going back to the class of 18. Uh, you can see the district fares well compared to the state uh, with 0.2%. That's the number of students in grades 9 through 12 that would have dropped out. Another way that the data is tracked is by cohort. So a cohort is a group of students that enter ninth grade together, and we track them over four years. Uh, and so over that four-year period, students are going to be categorized into one of four areas. They're either going to have graduated, received a GED, they're still in high school, or they dropped out. Uh, the red represents the state, and the blue represents CISD. And certainly, um, you know, very positive in that area with 95.3% graduating, 1% receiving a GED. 2.8% continuing and 0.9% dropping out. There's data for the class of the year before. This would be the five-year look at that cohort. And so as you might expect, over five years, the graduation rate's a little bit higher. This is 97.3%. Uh, received the GED is 1.2%. Continued uh, is going to be less. It's going to be 0.1% and then dropped out 1.3%. So after five years, and there's even a six-year cohort in terms of college-ready graduates for the class of 2018, 62.2% .2 of the graduates were deemed college-ready. This is based on scores on SAT, uh, ACT, and the college entrance uh, scores for the Lone Star College, the TSI. Um, and you can see we do well compared to many of our peer groups into the state and certainly want to acknowledge our board and uh, the fact that we've kept our 4 by 4 in place um, over the last few years as part of our graduation requirements, we think, attributes to our students being college ready. This is a look at the percentage of students that take advanced placement tests. Advanced placement tests are tests that students can take where they have an opportunity to test out of a course for uh, college. And uh, we both, we do, you know, some, you'll see some <coughs> districts are heavy into AP, some are heavy into dual credit. We, we, we 
try to do both, have a variety of options. So this represents how many of our uh, percentage of our students that are juniors and seniors that took AP tests, 34.4%. And this is the percentage that scored at or above the criterion, which is deemed what would be a three on an AP test. And so you can see it's 65.4%. Our students we tested a lot and they did pretty well compared to the state average of 50.7. In terms of dual credit courses, 24.4% of those <coughs> graduates in 2018 had taken a dual credit course. And again, that's a little higher than the state average. In terms of the percentage of students scoring at or above the criterion on the SAT or the ACT, it was at 63.7% again compared to 37.9% at the state level. And again, that's a very high number, and I think it's reflective of um, the expectations for students. Our SAT average uh, was 1162 for the class of 18 compared to the state 1036. The ACT average was 23.6 compared to 20.6 at the state level. Switching gears, um, as I mentioned, part of the annual report is some financial information. It's worth noting that Conroe, uh, along with Cy Fair, is, uh, there's just two school districts that have, for 10 consecutive years, received a rating of five stars on the Texas Smart Schools Award, which recognizes uh, student academic outcomes as well as um, efficiencies financially. Just a quick overview, the tax rate for the current school year is at $1.23, and this is kind of a look at how it compares to some of the districts in the surrounding area. And you can see that it, uh, with the exception of, uh, and Houston's not on here, would be lower. Where does, where does the money get spent? So this is a look at the percentages uh, based on all funds um, and based on the functions and what percentage are spent. 60.39%, uh, for example, of the instruction was spent on instruction compared to the state, 55.79%. Um, worth noting, uh, look, look at school leadership. The district spends a little bit more than the state average at 5.93 compared to 5.85. Uh, we spend a little bit more than the state average on health services. Uh, transportation, considerably more than the state average at 5.9% compared to 2.96%. Uh, we spend significantly less in food services. We spend less in extracurricular at 2.14% of the budget compared to 3.04%. District administration is uh, almost half of the state average at 1.64%. Um, and it's just some of the just some of the areas. Dr. Hines, can I go back on that slide? So this has been my question. Are we comparing apples to apples when we do the state or are we just blindly comparing to the state? So it's- How many students' it's, attendance are they calculating in this number to get those percentages? So it's based on a percentage of total state funds and then and percentage of the overall amounts that are spent. So it's calculated the same way. I, I always, one of the things I'm always reminded about with anything with reporting, it's all about coding. So whether, whether school districts code things exactly the same way will always have some slight variance. Um, but this represents a calculation pretty much the same way. In other words, how it's, how it's coded to that function is how this is calculated. So, so, for instance, administration, we're like ridiculously low in administration versus the state at 3.3. But our size helps that. It lends itself yes, to a absolutely. poor administration. So my point to that was about what size the state's using in their calculation. Because it doesn't seem like they get more, much of the leverage associated with being large. Well, it's again, it's total dollars. And so if you look at... Uh, the way that the students are distributed statewide, they're still mostly grouped in larger districts. So the large, far and away um, students, percentage of students are enrolled in what would be generally probably the top 40 or 50 school districts. So that, will, that would apply to a lot of, but there are many, many very small districts where those percentages might be significantly higher, but they also might be much smaller number of dollars. So Do we have something like this to peer districts. Is that, is that available? We could we could achieve that. That would be a little That's bit more sure. telling for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So staff information, this is just kind of a breakdown of where we compare to the state percentages. 49.4% of our staff are teachers, 2.6% are campus administrators, 0.4% uh, are in central administration, 27 0.7% of our staff are in auxiliary departments, and those would include things like transportation, child nutrition, maintenance, custodial. 
The average years of experience of our teachers is 10.9 compared to the, the state average of 11.1. The average years of experience of our principals is 8.2 years compared to 6.3. The average years in the district uh, for all employees, 6.7 to 7.2. Teacher turnover rate is 13.9% compared to the state average of 16.5%. And the average teacher salary is $57,478 for last year compared to the state average of $54,122. Next part of the report, we report each year there are uh, reportable, crim uh, reportable criminal incidents that happen on campuses, and so we report these each year. Last year, there were a total of 53 of these reportable campuses. They were took place at 11 different campuses, the bulk of those being certainly at the secondary campuses, 37 of which of those were felony-controlled uh, substance, so that certainly makes up the bulk of these criminal incidents that are reported. Uh, and these are certainly here and available on our website to kind of see if we do track that as well um, to give you an idea. Did you mention what the most common? The most common, yes, is the felony controlled substance. And really uh, the thing that's been an uptick is in the THC vaping, uh, which is still considered a controlled substance and it falls under that felony category. It's where there's been a lot of efforts this year for parent and student education programs and offering some evening events to try to really raise awareness about that that's a felony. Um, in terms of graduates attending four-year uh, public universities and two-year colleges, uh, overall we had 1,418 <coughs> students from that class of 2018 that enrolled these are just some of the campuses. You can see the highest being Lone Star College Montgomery, followed by Texas A&M uh, and University of Texas at Austin and Sam Houston State University. And Blinn College had a, had a good number of students. There's some that are, were not trackable. There are some that go out of state. And certainly there are certain, um, again, this is all dependent on being able to track that information. Counselors and librarians per campus, certainly we, re we report this. As required, um, you can see that all of our campuses have a counselor, at least one counselor, and at least one librarian. Some campuses may have more than one uh, librarian. And then certainly uh, all the, as we get into the larger schools, they have multiple counselors. We have 142 total counselors and 63 total librarians. The annual reforms report, along with this slide presentation, will, the annual report's already up there. We'll add this slide presentation tomorrow. And certainly that people can go to get links. Uh, we also had some extra copies of the taper if you want to grab one. We have a few extra on the table. And this will conclude our annual report. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Thank you. At this time, we will receive comment. If anyone has a comment specifically on the annual report, uh, you can make your way to the podium. Okay, seeing no takers, that will conclude our public hearing. Mr. President. All right. I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Means Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is 619. All right. Mr. Moore, please lead us in our invocation and prayer. Please, please. If you're so inclined, would you please bow with me? God of all people in all places at all times, we thank you for another day to serve you. We thank you for these people gathered here and their hearts for the children of this district. We thank you that we have a process and a government that allows our people a voice in their own governance. We pray tonight that you would help us to set aside any differences that we may bring, that we would place your vision in front of us, and that you would help us align our will with your will. We pray that you would give us your eyes to see and your ears to hear so that we may decide what is best for the students, the employees, the stakeholders, and the citizens of this great district. We pray that you would go before us to lead us, beside us to encourage us, and behind us to pick us up when we stumble. In all the ways that we know and acknowledge you, we lift our prayers this day. Amen. 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 Would you please join me in the Pledge to the American flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the Texas flag. Honor, Honor the, the Texas, Texas flag. flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, item number two, awards and recognitions, special district recognitions, uh, patrons in fluent education. Dr. No. Okay, Dr. Hines will make this presentation. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. No. Tonight, the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees recognizes the Education for Tomorrow Alliance with the Patrons Influencing Education Award for its dedication and support to the school children of Conroe Independent School District. The Education for Tomorrow Alliance is a nonprofit organization that grew from its roots as a 1989 project of the Woodlands Chamber of Commerce, which, which goal was to encourage the next generation of science, math, and <coughs> technology and engineering workers to where it is today, which is its own independent organization whose mi mission is to cultivate education and community partnerships that advance student success. This 30-year-old partnership brings together members of the, this community, our businesses that serve our community, and educators in order to give local students hands-on opportunities in the STEM fields and beyond. EFTA provides resources and sponsors such programs as Career Connections, Future Focus, Next Generation Leadership, Student Internship Programs, of which my son did when he was back way back when, um, when he was worked at the newspaper. Um, it also does the SciTech Exposition, which begins to gear up, by the way, at the end of this month with the Chevron Phillips Junior and Senior High School Science Fairs. Uh, it also includes the Forensic Science Demonstrations, the Huntsman Elementary Science Festival, the Math Bowl, the PBK Sci-Mathalon, Robotics Demonstrations, the Junior High Science Bowl, the Biotechnology Competition, the Repsol Senior High School Engineering Design Competition, and it concludes with the Consolidated Communications Junior High Engineering Design Competition the last weekend in February. And by the way, we are always in need of judges for these events, and it's a great way to volunteer, so uh, hopefully we can find some volunteers uh, to participate in that area. All of these events are designed to promote science, technology, engineering, and math learning through these 13 hands-on STEM competitions that teach critical thinking skills enabling students to thrive in any career field. As part of the competition, SciTech also awards thousands of dollars in scholarships to students for their achievements. Over the past 30 years, more than 100,000 students have participated in SciTech programming with the support of over 25,000 educators and volunteers. Tonight, we recognize the Education for Tomorrow Alliance, and with us is EFTA President Monica baumkamp Ania. And also with us is Program Director, Director uh, Corrine Coulter. Ask them to come up. Thank you. President Williams, member of the board, and Dr. Knoll, on behalf of, of our team at EFTA, we thank you for a history of, of a really great partnership to, to help support kids along the way. Our, our programs have been successful because you are a district that is all about innovation, all about finding ways that, that make sense to bring adults who have something to teach into, into the classroom and, and other spaces where there's a chance to do some hand-on learning. And so we really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of that for the past 30 years. Um, I have to say that um, I also want to acknowledge the wonderful partnership we have with teachers, Cheryl as the science, Cheryl Heim as a science coordinator, and it's because the kids are excited. It's because the teachers are excited about giving the kids something to learn, and and that's 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 really been rooted in the success of the past thirty years. Is these amazing educators that just want to give a little extra, that want kids to explore and want kids to be excited about science, and I and I will just. Um, I'll wrap up with the fact that every single year, probably the best advertisement for the district is having adults come out and volunteer because every single year folks come up to me and say, I feel good about our future. I feel good about the kids, about who, those that are going to take over someday for us because the kids are always so impressive in what they're doing and what they're learning in the ways that they're thinking. And that, again, is a testament to the great work of our district. 
So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I knew you were fake here. <laughs> oh, <Ooh. Girl>, Catherine. <laughs> Brian, you make us all nervous. <laughs> well, on behalf of the board, we, we want to say, you know, thank you for all the work that you guys do as well. Uh, it's an easy partnership for us to have, and we're grateful for all of the many volunteers. Um, as you'll probably notice, that some of the people sitting up here have also volunteered and been in classrooms as well because we feel so strong about it. And, and I love the, the STEM programs that you're involved in, but I also have to say that I, I was fortunate enough to be a part of, I believe it was called Choices years ago, and, and Choices, it, it's interesting <clears throat> that EFTA has a big <clears throat> span from the, 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 the science fair all the way down to encouraging kids to stay in school. And we just heard today uh, about our dropout numbers, and I remember 12, 15 years ago when I started working with EFTA, uh, the dropout numbers for the district were around 2%, and I think today Dr. Hines said it was 0.2% for Dr. Hines. I think mm -hmm. it was 0.2%, mm -hmm. and that has to do with a lot of the work that you guys are doing in the programs. So all means all fits right into what you guys do as well. So thank you for what you do. We appreciate it, and this is an easy partnership. So we appreciate you. Walk on it a minute ago. <laughs> oh, you really do. Really Josh was dancing. It's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. Thank you for all you did. Appreciate him and Josh. Thank you for all you dropped it. Yeah. Be careful. You might want to see that. Outstanding. And we did not forget your actual pie. We owe you a pie. So yes. we'll we're going sure. to deliver it to the next board meeting. We'll make sure we follow. <laughs> yeah. We'll be there. Outstanding. All right. Item <clears> two uh, B: Special recognition. Uh, District recognition, Conroe ISD Board of Trustees. Dr. No, please. Well, as you can see tonight, we have so many members of our district leadership in the room um, to be here tonight to show their appreciation for you and all that you do. And speaking on their behalf will be our great principal from McCullough Junior High, Mr. Chris McCord. <clears throat> President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Noll. It's my honor to stand in front of you as a spokesperson for all Conroe ISD administrators, educators, staff members, and students to personally thank each and every one of you for all that you do for the Conroe Independent School District. Daily, you demonstrate strength and dedication as you focus on excellence for CISD communities, teachers, staff members, and most importantly, our students. You unselfishly contribute your time and talents toward the advancement of our schools and the students we serve. You are extraordinary individuals who have voluntarily tackled the enormous job of governing our school district. Your actions and decisions affect the present and future lives of our children. But we are making a special effort this month to, uh, to show our appreciation. Please know that we are thankful for all that you do 365 days a year. Our students have demonstrated their appreciation by providing the cards, posters, banners, small gifts, drawings, and candy that you see here tonight. Please accept these tokens as our appreciation of thanks for your leadership support and the numerous hours you give to make our district truly the outstanding place it is to live, work, and go to school. In many ways, you're helping to ensure that our students graduate with confidence and competence. In doing so, you're helping to build strong families as well as a caring and active community. I ask all in attendance tonight to join me with a round of applause to honor and thank the CISD Board of Trustees for their hard work dedication, and commitment to create a broad future for all of our students. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it, and uh, it's definitely... Uh, yeah, our, Is that candy? <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely a labor of love for me, and I know I speak on behalf of the board when we say that um, we enjoy what we do, um, and we, we enjoy the uh, effects that we can visibly see in the classrooms and throughout the administration 
Um, so it's, it's actually uh, a blessing for us to actually serve. So um, we thank you and we thank you guys for showing us a appreciation here. And we always get a kick out of some of the gifts we get. I actually miss that picture that they that they draw of me every year. <laughs> That's always cute. So thank you. And I want to tell all of us, make, give the message back to the kids and, and to the administrations that actually put forth their time and effort to construct some of the gifts and purchase some of the gifts for us. We really appreciate it. We thank you all for all that you do, all your support as well. You guys make our job very easy. So we really thank that. Thank you for that. Gentlemen. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, let's go. Item 2C, citizen participation. Do we want to give you guys an opportunity to exit here? <laughs> no? That'd be, be fine. If you'd like to, yes. <laughs> they do have a principal's meeting first thing in yeah, the morning. Yeah, I they mean. <laughs> they can't be late to. We appreciate you coming out, but I'm going to give you an opportunity yeah. to kind of manage well, it. Welcome to stay. Joe choose. Yeah. Welcome to stay, always. <clears throat> I know those kids put a lot of, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's homework to check at home. Mm -hmm. All right, citizen participation. Ms. Copper, has anyone registered address report? Yes, sir, five citizens have registered. Okay, the next item on the agenda, agenda is citizen comment. It's public comment from those who have registered to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Everyone is reminded that this portion of the meeting is not appropriate form for bringing complaints for which resolution is sought. Before complaints can be submitted to the board of trustees as an agenda item, they must be addressed by the following, by following the appropriate policies and administrative procedures. Also, please keep in mind that the board has no obligation to protect the confidentiality of information that could personally identify a student. The board cannot permit comments that include students' names or any information that might identify a student. This, pro this, prohibi this prohibition does not apply if the person speaking is the student's parent or a guardian or is over the age of 18 and speaking about him or herself. If an issue is mentioned that is not on tonight's posted agenda, the board would defer discussion of the issue until the board uh, item is reached on the agenda. For any s subject that is not on the board's posted agenda, the board cannot deliberate or make a decision, but can furnish specific factual information or cite existing policy in response to inquiries. Each person is limited to no more than three minutes for their presentation. This will allow the board to hear from citizens as well as ensure the board meeting runs efficiently. As there are many important items on the board's agenda that must be considered, everyone in attendance is reminded to treat all speakers with respect, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with the speaker's message. Anyone, any person who does not conduct himself or herself accordingly will be asked to leave or will be escorted from the room. Ms. Godfrey, please call your first person. Nicole May. Hi, good evening, uh, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Knoll. Guess what I'm here to talk about? Dyslexia. Um, I have a handout that I just wanted to see if you could pass yeah. around. Yeah. Thank you. you Um, the handout is information from TEA um, as it relates to HB3 implementation for special education and the dyslexia allotment. Um, so obviously I'd like to just talk about the dyslexia allotment. Um, it, it, it appears that there is an expected approximate $2 million dyslexia allotment coming. And of course, this is the first time ever that there's been any kind of dyslexia allotment. Um, so it's kind of a big deal for our population. Um, we know we're under-identifying dyslexics in our district by a fairly large margin. I think it said 4.3% up there. And experts say that it's one in five, about 20%. So there's quite a few more dyslexic students, um, struggling readers that are dyslexic, that we can help. And I think this $2 million would make a big difference for our um, struggling readers that are dyslexic. So I just wanted to bring that to you guys' attention. Um, I don't know if you know about it or not. I know that yep. our population is very excited about it, and we feel that there are a lot of struggling readers out there in our district that would benefit greatly from a lot more dyslexia teachers in the district. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Anne-Marie Kennedy. Okay. 
My name is Anne Marie Kennedy. My daughter is in Conroe ISD. Um, I'm here to talk about Dale Inman's public behavior. It's unfortunate he's not here. However, um, this evening I'll highlight about 30 minutes of the Golden Hammer um, recording that's from October 26th, 2019 on YouTube, and I cover about 30 minutes of an hour and a half. Um, Eric Yalik is the host, Dale Inman was a guest, and it's very clear that he is a Conroe ISD trustee listed on the website in print as well as throughout the recording. I've record, and I've included times. At 11.47 into the show, they call CPS and report Anthony and Diane Lane, who are parents and a teacher in um, Willis, and say that they are abusing their son because they did not, because um, Eric and Dale did not agree with a Facebook post that Mr. Lane had made, and they repeated the child's name and full address on the air. Dale did not object to this. During the show, Eric was critical of the cosmetology education and critical of all Texas schools. At the 1913 uh, mark, Dale nodded in agreement. And from our earlier report, we know this isn't true. At 1954, is a critical of Conroe ISD and Willis ISD, mocked the concept of emotional learning, said students no longer have desks in the classrooms and are put into groups and report that this is in order to change their attitudes, values, beliefs, and behaviors and their education. At 2105, they report that they're critical of the school's teaching and that it's propaganda um, for the anti-bullying campaign that Conroe ISD has and that they're making, making the students, or making the children work together, and their words were like a communal lifestyle. At 22.14, Eric confronts Dale about the Conroe ISD board meetings and how they are run and who sets the agenda. At 22.30, uh, can't read my handwriting, um, we are informed that Dale refused to sign the Conroe ISD code of conduct. Eric is critical of the Conroe ISD board and assigns Dale tasks to find out who sets the agenda, et cetera, and he's very critical of Dr. Knoll. Eric references Anthony Lane's Facebook post and directs Dale to place it on the Conroe ISD agenda to make a, re a formal resolution to discuss it and for Conroe ISD to post it on their page and put <coughs> in big letters, N-O-T, that they disagree with it. Dale agrees to send this to the Conroe ISD board and to adopt this resolution of a Willis ISD teacher and parent, the one that they called CPS on. Just in case you think that Dale was always a yes man on this show, when Eric called Dr. Knoll a dictator um, and was further critical of him, Dale said he could not abide by that and he liked the superintendent. Um, at 29.13, Dale only wants reading, writing, arithmetic, some U.S. history, and some <laughs> world history. That does not meet the needs of the students of 2020, as evidenced by everything you presented this evening. Um, and um, my objection is that this is public behavior, where he's saying he's not representing Conroe ISD, and yet he's representing Conroe ISD and accepting assignments from other people on what he will do when he comes to the Conroe ISD board, board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Nix. Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm trying to curse on the LGBT. I know Dale Emmons isn't here, but of course he's watching it all and they're going to be watching on the video. It's time for Dale Emmons to step down. We need to get past this. May 2020. Heal from this. May 2020, a much better year. Getting someone on here that's more 
equality friendly than this Dell Inman. That's one of the things I have to say about that. Again, other things I have to talk about. I want to see policy change to where we can have delivery at the schools like Conroe High School. I'm a delivery driver. I do the Uber Eats, Postmates stuff. Kids still do it. Delivery. I just want to make it to where a table or something for us to deliver onto it. Another thing I want to ask is to have change the Wi-Fi settings to where we can assess social media on here. Cell phone coverage stinks in this building. I have Cricket. No, I have Cricket and Verizon. Cricket, no service. Verizon, one bar, and you can't hardly do anything with one bar. So those are the three things I'd like to see, of course, most importantly for Dillon and to resign, where we can get past this. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Walker. Good evening. Um, I'm sure you can probably guess by my brightly colored sweater why I'm here to talk tonight. Um, I just want to start with an apology. I know this is exhausting. I know you guys are exhausted. I know the audience is exhausted, but we have to keep coming. Um, I do want to thank you all. I want to thank Conroe ISD. Um, I'm a mom of three Conroe ISD students, soon to be four. Um, Conroe ISD has been such a blessing in our lives. Um, my oldest son has dyslexia, and if it wasn't for his dyslexia teacher um, at Oak Ridge Elementary, I really don't know where he'd be. So we're very thankful, and I apologize to ha keep having to come. Um, I'm not here to be divisive tonight, but frankly, if just one kiddo hears somebody speak up and speak out for them, and it can just make them feel not alone, that's why I'm here. Um, specifically why I'm here tonight, and it's a shame that Mr. Inman is not here, um, but it was a post on his Facebook equating the LGBTQ community to pedophiles. Um, I'm not going to bother to tell you about the website because it's a garbage website. It's not a news source. It's fake news. Um, the LGBTQ community is not going to add a P for pedophile. Um, but specifically, what was very alarming in that post to me was a comment from somebody in the comment section saying, if my kid was ever approached by one of those, I would put a bullet in his head and a bullet in his chest. I understand that speech is free, and we're free to post what we would like on our Facebook page. But when you hold a position on the school board and you are an elected official, you are in a position to hold yourself to a higher standard. We're in a day and age right now where kids are afraid to go to school because they might get shot at, and to allow space for hate and negativity and, frankly, violence like that is just not OK. Um, so that was very alarming. Um, Again, he, Dale Enman is held to a higher standard. Um, we've yet to hear an apology from him. He says that he's apologized. He has not apologized publicly. Um, and instead of apologizing, he continues to spread hate and to spread <laughs> negativity. Um, in our home, we love Jesus. And because we love Jesus, we talk to our kids all the time about how we make space in our home and at our table for all ethnicities, all religious beliefs, all sexual orientations, and all gender identities. But what we don't make space for is hate. And I understand that Mr. Inman likes to hide behind the fact that he's a Christian, but I am a Christian too. Nobody is asking him to adopt different values, different beliefs, or go against what he believes is correct with his faith. What we're asking him to please stop doing is please stop inciting hate. It has to stop, and that's why I'm here to talk to you tonight. I'm sure you'll see me again, because it doesn't look like he's going to stop anytime soon, and that's very unfortunate, because I know that you all work very hard, and you give up time away from your families, and this is exhausting to have to hear about board meeting after board meeting. So I do thank you for allowing us to have a space to come and bring these concerns. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Christy Swoboda. <clears throat> Good evening, board, President Williams, Dr. Null. I'm Christy Swoboda. I'm vice president of Conroe TSTA, and I'm here tonight to thank you all for the job that you do for the district, for us every day, for the things that you put forth for us, and to tell you how proud we are to be sponsors with you again 
of the 2020 um, Salute to Education, which will be Thursday, May 7th at 7 p.m. at the Woodlands United Methodist Church. Um, and our president, Carrie Freemeyer, is here. Our past president, Cheryl Dentler, is here. And we want to make sure that um, everyone in the audience knows that not that night we will be honoring each campus's Teacher of the Year, Rising Star for teachers with zero to three years of experience, Humanitarian of the Year for other personnel in the school, and for your friends of education for each campus, be it community members or volunteers within the community who come up to help the schools. Um, once again, we thank you for everything that you do for us, and we look forward to continuing the relationship. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. That's it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, item three is consent agenda. Jenna, I have yet to receive any request to remove anything. With that being said, I would like to entertain a motion. I'd move approval of the consent agenda as presented. I have a motion, Mr. Second. Moore. We have a second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. Um, item four, administration. For, for a consider approval of application of 2019-2021 TEA um, school safety and security grant, Dr. No. All right, Mr. Jim Caker, Assistant Superintendent for Operations will present. Thank you, Dr. Null, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Null. Um, I'm asking for your consideration of approval of the application for the 2019 to 2021 Texas Education Agency School Safety and Security Grant. Uh, during the 86th legislative session, Senate Bill 500 authorized the Texas Education Agency to establish the School Safety and Security Grant. This grant provides funding for districts to address school safety needs of campuses. The grant is allocated based on district size, and the Texas Education Agency published a list of allocation amounts by the district. CISD is eligible to receive $1,016,765 during the grant period, which will end May 31, 2021. The single largest purchase will likely be district's conversion to digital two-way radios to increase consistent communication throughout campuses. The grant does not require any matching funds, and if the district is awarded funds under the grant program, the district anticipates receiving funds this spring. I ask for your approval. So moved. Second. Motion second. Discussion? You are none. All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Caker. Very much so. Appreciate it. Uh, item 4B, consider waiver for exemption of full day pre-kindergarten for 2019-2020 school year. Dr. Noll. All right. Dr. Debbie Phillips. <coughs> Good evening, President Williams, Board of Trustees, Dr. Null. My purpose tonight is to seek your approval to request a waiver to be exempt from providing full-day pre-kindergarten for the 2019-2020 school year. In addition, I'd like to provide an update regarding our recent partnership applications. As you know, House Bill 3 impacts how public schools provide pre-K. One of the major changes is that we are now uh, required to provide full day pre-K rather than half day pre-K and this went into effect for this school year 2019-2020. However, districts may request and submit a waiver to TEA no later than March 2nd. The law did not change pre-kindergarten eligibility. To be eligible for pre-K, a student must still meet one of the following criteria. Qualify as economically disadvantaged, be unable to speak or comprehend English, if the child is homeless or has a parent who is active duty member of the military, or if a child has a parent or guardian who was injured or killed while serving on active duty, or a child who has ever been in foster care. Additionally, children can qualify if they are the child of a person eligible for the Texas Star Award. To be eligible for the waiver, a school district must demonstrate the needs to construct classroom facilities to provide full day pre-kindergarten. In addition, to apply for this exemption, a school district must also solicit and consider proposals for partnerships with public and private entities regarding offering full-day pre-kindergarten. Districts may apply for a one-year, a two-year, or a three-year waiver. So Conroe ISD did solicit applications for possible partnerships on our website from November 20th through December 9th, and we had five potential partners apply. 
We then had a committee convene to review the applications. However, at this time, we really feel that we can make full day pre-K happen next year without the need to utilize partners. We're expecting quite a few students, approximately 1,600 to 1,700 pre-K students, and we feel we can find space through several avenues. First of all, we can utilize portable buildings in some places until the new schools we have planned for are built. These portables are going to be needed anyway in the future to replace some of our portables that are nearing the end of their usefulness. In some parts of the district, we may shift pre-K programs to buildings where we have space. For example, we're tweaking the zoning right now in the woodlands. Once we determine where we have space, it's very possible we'll shift pre-K programs to maximize where there's room. Finally, we're also considering intra-district transfers for pre-K in some parts of the district. We have parents who may live in Conroe or Caney Creek but work in the woodlands. If they would like to enroll their children, their pre-K children closer to where they work and we have space, we're open to that possibility. Our decision to not utilize partnerships at this time was not taken lightly. We've never done anything like this before, and we really carefully considered the pros and the cons. On the upside, there were several potential partners, partners who have great facilities and good programs. We realized that if we partnered, we could save some space. And in addition, all partners offered before and after school day care for a fee, which would be valuable to a lot of working parents. On the downside, the locations were not always ideal. Four of the five partners were located in the Woodlands, which is currently where the fewest students reside currently. If there had been a potential partner in Conroe or Caney Creek, we could have strongly recommended, strongly considered them. In addition, the partnership will require supervision and management. While we're contracting out these services to a private provider, we still have to ensure that the partner is providing a high quality program as defined by the state. The other roadblock is that none of the providers could serve large numbers of students. As I shared earlier, we plan on serving approximately 1,600 to 1,700 students. Our potential partners reported they could serve anywhere between 58 to 80 students at each location. This is a small percentage relative to the number of students that we plan to serve. Finally, we really prefer to serve our own students if possible, and we think we're, we're good at it. <laughs> These are students feeding into our kinder programs for the most part, and we'd love the opportunity to work with them as early as possible. Some of these students will speak English as a second language or could possibly have a disability. Our teachers and staff are trained and certified to support this diverse population. So just to give you a quick look at how we think we can make this work. Uh, in the Caney Creek feeder, we anticipate serving 326 students, and we would need four portables at Austin Elementary. We would find space at the other schools. Conroe feeder, we anticipate 688 students. This would entail uh, two portables at Anderson, uh, three portables at Patterson, and two portables at Rice Elementary. Grand Oaks feeder, approximately 116 students are expected, and we would need a portable at Snyder, but we think we could do it everywhere else. At the Oak Ridge feeder, we anticipate 199 students, and we feel like we have the space we need. We might possibly need a portable at Kaufman, but we think we're, we're okay there now as well. Woodlands feeder, uh, anticipate 112 students. We would need right now, as the way th things stand, we would need three portables at Glenlock. We would need uh, a portable at Powell, but again, with the tweaking of the rezoning, we might possibly not need any portables at all, depending on where the space lands. And then finally, in the College Park feeder zone, we would need uh, two portables at Lamar. Again, this could also be impacted by the, the uh, tweaking of the zones. So this waiver re request was approved by our district level planning and decision making committee on January 15th. So unless there are questions, we seek your approval to apply for a waiver to be exempt from providing full day pre-K for this 1920 school year. I move questions? we approve as presented. I have a motion. Second. A second discussion. Yes. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> Dr. Phillips. Sure. Have one. So we're requesting a one-year waiver Correct. this time. Correct, just right. one year for, for this, this year. For this current school year. Mm -hmm. and, and we then, were ready to go next year. Okay, so we don't feel like we're gonna need a, 
a waiver next year. No. But we've got a plan in place mm -hmm. that we should be able to implement full day pre-K starting in the fall of this coming year. That is correct. Okay. So currently we have two or three schools doing full-time? We have two right now, two. Houston Elementary and Hauser. Okay, just mm -hmm. two. And the number of students that we are serving today yeah. is about 1,600. But they're half day. They're half day. They're still half day today. Mm -hmm. But at Houston, are you asking about the individual schools? I'm talking about the, the, the two that we're doing full time, full day okay. pre K. Yeah, Houston. How many are we serving there? Houston is serving about 115. Okay. And Hauser. 100 and something too. They have uh, they have four teachers, so I would say they they probably have 20, 40, 60, 80, 80 okay. to 90. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. But today we're serving on a half day. Everywhere else. 1,600 students mm -hmm. or so? Okay. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So, if we're serving 1,600 total, okay, is that including Hauser even though they're annual? I mean, no, all day long? Full yes. Day, whatever. Okay. So, we're already serving 1,600. The difference is we're going to be serving 1,600 all day long. Correct. Instead We're serving two, about 200 all day long now, but we will be serving 1,600 all day long next year. Okay. And, and we do, we, we when we've been planning this, we have anticipated that we'll have more kids show up than typical. That's what happened at Houston. We were planning on a certain number, but a lot of parents, when they found out it was full day, rather than utilize you know, a daycare or what they were doing, they put them in the Houston program. So we do, we are planning for a 10% increase mm -hmm. when we go full day everywhere. Okay. 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 Do another one, go ahead. The, the next question I have is, you know, I mean, portable buildings seem pretty simple to provide, and, mm -hmm. but when you start needing 10 of them mm -hmm. next August, or is that in... We've already, we've, we already yeah, have we've a already purchase started. order in place. Yeah. We've already ordered them, yes, sir. Uh -huh. so, so we're not building them, we're purchasing them, right. and they're, they're, they're available. Yes. Correct. Yep. That's it? No, not necessarily. So, so the inclusion of the portables, we import a portable to an elementary classroom. I hope I know the answer to this. I just want to make sure it's official in the record. Uh -huh. We're not putting four-year-olds in the portables. We're no. going to export a larger, an older elementary to the portable and put the little ones inside the building. That is absolutely correct. Make sure that was in the record. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was I was curious about that as well because I was going to say I don't like the idea of put them in portables. No, 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 littles out. But, of but portables. those portables are the new ones, right? The ones, yes, like the one at Canyon Creek. Yes. Okay. But it's still harder to yeah. get them in and out yeah. of the building because the buildings are locked now. And, yeah, and, and they need access to restrooms and, and, and everything, but the students don't necessarily. So it's an issue. Understood. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's a mandate, and understanding that I, I just don't like the idea of outsourcing it. Um, so I think the plan that you guys have put forth is definitely a great one. And the contingency plan, assuming we're not go live or ready for next year, we can get another exemption. Am we I could, honest? yes. We could, okay. I'm not saying that but we, we would, don't anticipate needing that at all. Fair enough. That's just a couple of questions as well. Are we also providing um, transportation? For, the, for these yes these if, if we do open up intradistrict tra transfers and a, a parent wants to bring their child out the zone we won't be able to provide transportation there but right now all where, where they're zoned to there will be transportation provided okay if they live within the miles no, radius I, I like the idea as well um, but going through the exemptions mm -hmm. we're applying for an exemption it's just more of a clarity for me because I was going through the list of what you have to have in order to get the exemption. So even though you you um, got some applications to outsource it, the exemption does says we have to look into it. We don't have to actually accept it. So that that's why correct. we're we still okay with getting mm -hmm. the exemption. That's, that's correct. correct. We have to consider outside you have to partnerships. Consider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. you bet. All right. We have a motion second. Gentlemen, all in favor? Motion passes. I'll Thank send you. Them. Thank you, Dr. Phil. Um, item 4C, consider authorization to submit a missed school days waiver for Knox Junior High. All right, Mr. Greg Colson. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. Tonight, we're asking for your approval of a missed school days waiver for Knox Junior High School. 
Texas Education Agency allows school districts to apply for a waiver to excuse any instructional days from ADA funding calculations that have an attendance at least 10 percentage points below the last school year's overall average. Attendance for the campuses due to inclement weather, health, or safety-related issues. Knox Junior High School was closed on January 9th and 10th, 2020, due to an electrical short in an energy transformer that caused a fire which resulted in significant damage to the school's electrical gear and wiring. Knox Junior High was closed for two days to repair and remediate the significant electrical damage. In addition to the mechanical room in which the equipment, electrical equipment is housed, it received water damage as a result of the sprinkler system deploying. I would like to recognize Marshall Schrader, Dwight Martin, and their maintenance staff, along with Entergy, Crawford Electrical Supply, and Diamond Electric, who worked four long days to get Knox back up and running. Without their efforts, the loss of instructional time would have been much greater. Due to the missed school days this year for Tropical Storm Imelda, Knox Junior High has activated all missed minutes for the 2019-20 school year. If TEA approves the waiver application, Knox Junior High School students will not be required to make up the estimated 380 minutes that we anticipate being short, and the days will not be used to cal calculate average daily attendance and fund foundation school funding. The missed school days waiver has already been approved by the district level planning committee. We ask for your approval of the waiver. So moved. We have a motion. Second. Second. All in for, um, discussion. All right. Can we make Mr. Dahl make up those day, those minutes? Yeah, he needs to get at it. <laughs> All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Coach. Um, item 4B, consider approval of 2020-2021 school calendar. Dr. Null, Mr. Right. Hines. Mr. Hines. All right. Good evening again. President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll, uh, it is uh, my pleasure to present to you on behalf of our district level uh, committee, um, the school calendar process and a recommendation for your consideration and hopefully approval. Uh, just to kind of quickly go through the timeline in October, the district level committee began discussion on the possible calendars. We actually conducted a survey at that time which had uh, 3,660 responses. And then in November, we presented to you information and to see if you had any feedback. Uh, we went back to the board after that meeting and presented that information. And certainly we worked on and developed selected draft calendars to publish for public feedback. Those calendars went up right after, or right before Thanksgiving and been up uh, for a while through early January. We received uh, roughly 1,650 responses to those two draft calendars. Um, as a result, the committee at their meeting on January 15th actually uh, put together really a hybrid of those two calendars to bring to you uh, for your uh, consideration uh, tonight. And I'd like to take you through a little bit of what's in that calendar. Um, first of all, I want to touch on the survey. Um, shared this a little bit last time. And the survey was interesting because we had a lot of responses. And uh, one of the reasons we did that is because as you'll we all hear and there's a lot of feedback and we've shared that feedback with you is that there's there's competing interests more or less in developing a calendar right there are things that people like and some people like some things more than others and just to give you a little bit a little bit people like starting in the midweek um, there's a real strong feeling about ending the semester prior to winter break there's a very it's not a large group but there's a very um, uh, committed group to trying to achieve some balance in those semesters for academic purposes uh, Sixty-seven percent wanted to begin school later. Uh, we heard that was probably the number one feedback is why we started so early. Um, however, seventy-eight percent want to end the semester prior to the winter break more than beginning later. So they had to pick the two. Uh, people would rather end in May than start earlier. Uh, so certainly that was a consideration is looking at a June ending time. Uh, we also know the week off at Thanksgiving is popular. Um, people like that. Uh, the October holidays popular. Um, and certainly, um, but people would rather have their week off at Thanksgiving than their holiday in October. So we tried to give them some choices and trying to get some feedback. And with that, trying to understand all those different wants and likes, it's hard to really come up with a calendar that everybody agrees upon. Um, but the committee discussed the feedback, looked at the pros and cons, and, um, and brought forward for your consideration draft A revised, it is called. And uh, certainly I want to point out some of the highlights of that draft day calendar. Um, 
our district of innovation status allows us to begin school prior to August 24th, uh, that which would be the first day of instruction normally. Uh, this would be August the 12th under this calendar. There's certainly a certain number of staff development days that happen before that. We've been uh, traditionally doing the last several years. One of those days has been an online makeup through some safety training. Uh, the calendar contains the required 75,600 minutes of instruction. It also assumes we'll continue with the current length of our school days, 430 and 435 minutes, respectively. With the additional minutes, give us enough time for two inclement weather makeup days, and we use those uh, mm -hmm. this year. So those minutes have come in handy. Actually, the last couple of years, we've used those minutes. Uh, students attend school under this calendar for 175 instructional days. That's uh, two less than what we've done this year, but there's also two fewer uh, early release days, and I'll show those in a minute. Uh, the staff will continue to work 187 days. Uh, we will, and if we approve this calendar, it means we are committing to renewing our waiver, which allows us to uh, waive up to 2,100 minutes for staff development purposes, um, so which are included in staff development days and early release days. That process doesn't open until the spring, and so I just remind you because we'll come back and ask for that waiver, and just remember if we approve the calendar, we'll need the waiver. Um, Highlights of this calendar, um, there are staff development days. There are two early release days, October the 9th and um, March the 12th that were previously early release days that would become um, staff development days, and that 12th would actually be a head start on spring break, so that adds a day to the spring break. Um, the, you know, in looking at, we've talked about pre-K and our gearing up and needing to do a lot of training with pre-K, and certainly there's a new reading initiative uh, and training for our uh, teachers in elementary school that we'll have to start. We'll have three years to do that, and it's going to be a significant amount of training. So certainly that was one of the things that was discussed by the district level the committee is looking for ways to try to um, build in some time for training as opposed to having people pulled off of uh, campuses for training. Thanksgiving holiday would be November 23rd through the 27th. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention January 5th and March 12th are also um, staff building days. There's also a holiday on October the 12th and February 12th through the 15th. And so um, that October holiday, you know, it looks kind of um, random out there, but it, it turns that into a four-day weekend for students and their families. Um, but the, not, uh, the 12th would normally be that day we've been taking off, and the 9th was that staff building day that was previously an early release day. The, uh, in February, uh, it is a true uh, holiday on the 12th and a holiday on the 15th. Um, that 12th day is also noted as a makeup day for inclement weather for staff. Um, the first semester would end on, on December the 18th under this calendar and would include 84 instructional days. The second semester would begin January the 6th and in, it would include 91 instructional days. So it's certainly within those 10 days of balance. The last day of instruction for students would be May 26, 2021. The spring break would be March uh, the 12th, which is that Friday, begins that Friday through the 19th. That would also be the end of the third nine weeks. It is currently the same spring break, and we looked up a few that are out, that are out right now. Lone Star College, Texas A&M, UT, Klein, and Humble have released that same spring break. It also includes two early release days, which would be December 18th and May the 26th. Those are at the end of the semesters. Just also worth noting in that calendar, there is an election day uh, day off, which is November. Uh, go back to that calendar. Um, you can see November the 3rd, and that is election day. That would be a staff development day. Uh, and then this calendar does end prior to Memorial Day. It's the first time we've done that in a long time. So that would be May the 31st. Of course, it helps that Memorial Day is late this year. But uh, So those are some of the, the features in this calendar, and we ask your consideration and hopefully approval this evening. I move approval of the calendar. Second. Our motion second in discussion. I do have Go ahead, Mr. Moore, one, you're up. one comment and one question for you. Thank you for your consideration on the election day. I know I, I beat that drum loudly the last couple of times you came before us. And we heard you. I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. And, and the people who sent me copious emails in 2018 appreciate that. Um, have we checked with... Um, Sam Houston and uh, the pavilion, because that end date's a little bit earlier than we have done. Are we going to run into any problems with graduations? 
So we're just in the preliminary, but we haven't we haven't nailed anything down. We usually wait till we get the calendar. And right. Once we nail it down. No informal conversations yeah. with them yet, just to see if it's available. Okay. The um, Sam Houston is you know we only go there for one graduation. It's usually fairly easy to work work around. We we're kind of the second pick there. Huntsville High School gets the first pick, and then we we usually get to go second. So we find a date. The pavilion is um, fairly open during that time of year. They they hold um, a lot of space for us. They're, they have an event there over Memorial Day weekend. That's an annual event. But beyond that, they they do a lot of flexible. You know that they know we're coming as well. So I know Mr. Colson, I'm sure we'll be in touch with Mr. Young tomorrow at the pavilion and so we'll get that there quickly. Okay. okay. It was our final day the 31st too. That's a definite <laughs> not, right? 27th is really 27th actually. 27th. Yeah. Yeah. The calendar shows 31st as a holiday. Well, it's for, it is for us right. still, yeah. Mr. Hubert? The, um, spring break, where did I see that? March on the twelfth, so the spring break starts on the twelfth, which yes. is a Friday, and then runs that that following week. Yes, Am sir. I reading that correctly? Yes, the twelfth would be a staff development day, so the staff wouldn't begin spring break yet, but right. the students would begin on that day. Okay, and then, I mean, it's, it just seems like the twelfth is awfully early to start <clears throat> start school. Well, have we ever started that early before? What did Not we start in my this year? Was it like the 15th? This year we started the 14th. It was the 14th. 14th. But we've also never been out before Memorial Day. Right. I guess that's the, you know, that's what we're trying to achieve. Get that done. Okay. Motion. There, there, you know, go back to over the years, what we've seen, you know, for many years we had a three-day break at Thanksgiving, so there was two days. And then you know, that October holiday came back in the play a few years ago, so that's a third day. Um, and, you know, certainly you can see that um, there's a, an election day in there, which is going to be a fourth day. Um, and then there's a staff development day in there, which is previously a half day, which instructionally has never been, um, haven't been tremendous. But these are some things that we consider. I mean, there's trade-offs in all of these that, that we have to, at some point, if we want to end the semester at the mid-year, and we, for a few years, we even ended the semester about the third week in January, which was rough. And we got a lot of negative feedback yeah. from that because students working through the break and not getting a clean break. So we had a lot of pushback to really look at changing that a few years ago. And that really was came with that um, that application for being a district of innovation, which enabled us to move up the calendar. And, and I think, you know, we've had a few where we've been right at that 10 or 12 days in balance. And, you know, we got a lot of negative feedback from the one semester teachers at the high school level. But there's a trade-off on, on all of these issues. And, 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 and we hear it. I mean, loud and clear, probably the single... Neg the biggest negative comment on these calendars was the early start. Um, but I, and that's something the committee gave a lot of discussion to. I want to share that. So sure. The nice thing about the November 3rd being there's just no students. So we're still open. There's staff development. There's just no students. So we don't have to worry about car lines and correct flow and stuff like that. Because we, we don't act, all we do is supply the building correct we're not correct. in charge of they bring their own yeah. election people bring their own all that stuff correct okay thank you thank you dr Hines. a motion second all in favor we did get a motion a second yes, yes we did. all right motion passes thank, thank you. you um item 4f receive update on attendance zone for elementary school in the woodlands and college park feeders Actually, we're going to go to uh, we're going to we're going to do. Oh, I'm do sorry. E. High All right. Consider, <laughs> consider approval of attendance zones, boundary <laughs> changes associated with the opening of Stockton Junior High. My apologies. Yeah, we already got Doctor Hodge is warm. We want to keep him in the game. <laughs> I'm already <laughs> up, so I just yeah. walked over here. Um, Again, away. thank you. We'd like. Uh, I know we've been talking about this. It seems like probably you think we've been talking about this a lot. Uh, we certainly have, and tonight we bring to you for your consideration. Um, the committee's recommendation for the zoning for uh, Stockton Junior High School. And just to kind of remind everyone, the um, we will be opening Stockton Junior High, which is a 1,450 roughly student junior high school that will open in August. Um, it will serve students in grades 7 and 8. It will be located at 2750 Excellence Avenue, which is next to Bosman Intermediate School. And just to kind of remind everybody of the location, it is uh, that's Excellent Avenue running um, between 
3083 in the loop. This is the junior high. There's Bosman, and that's the future high school site. Um, and Patterson is also on the same complex. We have current zones in, um, for the junior high of, of currently of Washington and um, Pete, and we wanted to look at that. Uh, to do that, we convened a committee which had representation from the schools in the Conroe feeder. Um, we had also representation from geographically all over the Conroe feeder, so we tried to get different viewpoints as we went through this process. And the committee was, did an outstanding job of working on this. The committee um, developed roughly 20 scenarios. Uh, they determined and, and brought forward after going through all these scenarios, three for feedback that were uh, put up on the web. Um, and also the committee talked about the intermediate zoning because um, based on the recommendations, we felt the need to try to tweak a little bit of that intermediate. But at the same time, we want to be mindful of there will have to be some future rezoning as it impacts grades five and six when we open a K-6 on the western side of Conroe and then when we open an intermediate in the Caney Creek feeder in the future, we'll want to uh, again revisit that. So after, after this process, which involved um, nine public meetings and eight committee meetings separate from those public meetings, uh, the committee is brought forward for, uh, as its recommendation, junior high school scenario B and intermediate scenario two. Uh, those two maps are um, actually available over on the side if, if you haven't seen those. Just to kind of quick review, Pete Junior High School currently at, is at 1,450 students. It's at capacity. They are currently at 52% uh, economically disadvantaged. Washington Junior High is currently at 964 students with 81% economically disadvantaged. And again, the goal was to uh, reduce the crowding at Pete to give Pete room for growth. Uh, at the same time, um, leave a little bit of room at Stockton. Uh, we know we're gonna be challenged for room in the future. Um, based on growth that's projected in the Conroe area. So we're seeing growth all around the Conroe area. Certainly it's happening a little bit faster currently on the western side of the district, but it's happening on all parts of our district. Um, so the recommendation is uh, B. Uh, from this map, the uh, lighter red represents the areas that currently are zoned to Pete that would move to Stockton, and the lighter blue represents some areas that are currently attending Washington that would go to Pete. When we calculated the impact, and obviously that's uh, very small, when we calculated the impact, we did not, we, we knew that every student that was at Washington was going to be impacted because Washington is not where they were going to be attending school. So we, we calculated it based on students that are, that were at Washington that ended at Pete or at Pete that ended up at Stockton. So that impact number was 492 current students, just to give you an idea of how many students are impacted. Uh, under this projection, and this is geocoded of who lives in those boundaries, not necessarily who ends up special programs or transfers will change that. Um, but this would end up with Pete at 1177 with 62.5% economically disadvantaged. Stockton would end up at 1,243 students, a little bit larger, um, at 75% economically disadvantaged with 492 impact. Can you show me where the 492 is? Me. Yes. Basically. Yes, so. I mean, maybe not every single kid. So that's what these, I'll show you here. Um, these are the areas of who's impacted on moving from Washington to Pete. So these areas add up to 114 students. These are different zones. And that's kind of a little description of the areas that are moving. And then from moving from Pete to Stockton, this is the other 378 students. And where they're coming from, you can see the largest Impacted areas, River Plantation, Stewart's Forest, uh, Lake Wildwood, um, Crystal Forest. Those are the, some of the larger areas that are impacted under um, those changes. Under the intermediates, um, again, the committee looked at that. This is our current intermediate boundary. Uh, the area that got really the most attention was uh, the area really of around uh, Robinwood. Um, and so under scenario two, it took this area and moved it, which is the lighter blue, and moved it to Bosman from Cryer so that those students would go to uh, Bosman and then stay at Stockton next door. Um, it is roughly uh, 32 students in that area. So that would, that would come in, uh, certainly, you know, it's going to make 
uh, Bosman tight in terms of enrollment, uh, but we know down the road we'll get some relief when we open another uh, intermediate school. So, it, it, but it, at the for the sake of having students not be split but be on the same site, we wanted to make that recommendation. And so that's really the recommendation of intermediate uh, scenario two, which makes that one tweak. Uh, and the total impact to the intermediate is 32 students currently, current students. So again, just to kind of wrap up, eight, eight times, nine public meetings over about a 14 week period. And that committee has brought forward for your consideration and recommends uh, that you adopt the junior high scenario B and intermediate school scenario two. General, got a motion. Move approval as presented. A motion. A second. second. Senator, a second. Let's go with discussion. Any discussion? I have one question for you. If I remember correctly from the previous slides on the SES, Pete went from 52 and a half to 62 and a half, and Washington at 81, Stockton going to 75, I believe. Yes, sir. Um, does that, <clears throat> do those numbers, is that significant enough to cause Pete to get a significant bump in their in any title funding or be eligible for programs they don't currently have? And likewise, are we going to lose any title programs from Washington that would not be available at Stockton? Great question. Currently, our secondary schools do not participate in the title okay. program, so it, it will not impact that. We, we, we use state comp ed funds mm -hmm. for that, and that we can adjust based on student enrollment. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion second. All in favor? Motion passes. Thank Good you, job. Dr. Hahn. No, Appreciate it. Great well job. Done. A lot of effort well done. for everybody. Thanks to the committee. And committee as well. I hope my breath for coffee. <laughs> committee as well. Thank you. Yeah. Ladies, I wanted to um, make sure we. we Go ahead. That's a different group. Go ahead. Okay. Do we think the dinner? Yeah, that was a diff that was ATPE that did the dinner. Oh, okay. that was TSDA. So make sure we call the right folks. <laughs> All right, let's go. Item four uh, F: Receive update on attendance zone for elementary schools in the um, in the Woodlands. I think we're now at that point. Sounds like yes, a we are form, indeed. Now we're there. We are there. <laughs> All right. I, we mentioned earlier. We had this conversation earlier. I don't know if this is a um, baton passing moment or not, but to present this next. Uh, <laughs> Boundary committee conversation will be Dr. Winkler. Okay. And Dr. Hines is smiling. <laughs> and I okay. said it wasn't baton passing, it was the baton hitting me on top of the head <laughs> as it was thrown at me. So, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Hines, is this where we start asking the questions that you told us to ask? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> He's ready. <laughs> Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. In November, Dr. Heinz came to you with the recommendation to establish an attendance boundary committee to look at the need for rezoning elementary and intermediate campuses in the Woodlands and College Park feeder zones to relieve overcrowding at some of our schools. Tonight, we'd like to provide you with um, an update and information on the committee's work this far. So as you recall, uh, much like with Stockton, um, parents, principals, and district staff were asked to be a part of this committee. Um, the campuses represented um, are those that could have had any potential changes made to them. And the scenarios tonight you see will not reflect changes to all of these campuses, but we wanted to make sure that they were adequate, adequately represented in case their name or conversation came up about their individual campuses. And their input has been invaluable during this process. So what was presented to you was uh, were three objectives to have our campuses within 110% of their capacity to plan for growth associated with the development along 1488, which we all know is growing rapidly, and to accommodate full day pre-K programs um, as available and as Dr. Phillips mentioned before. Um, and being mindful of that, um, we looked at Wright Elementary is currently at 131% capacity and it's utilizing 12 portables. And if you're familiar with that site, you know that those 12 portables are creatively put on that site. Lamar Elementary is roughly at 111% capacity and it's usually using six portables. Um, and we also wanted to consider Bush Elementary. It's not currently at that 110% mark, um, but we do know from our passive studies that 
um, bush is growing, um, mainly because of devel developments along the 1488 corridor, um, in particular River's Edge, which is a new community. Um, they are scheduled to start building homes very quickly um, with over 1,100 lots. Um, so we anticipate that Bush will be at 136% um, uh, capacity in five short years. That will, will come quicker than not. So during this um, process, uh, much like Stockton, we wanted to be mindful um, of all children in the process. We know that they are not just a number, that there is a person, there is a family behind each and every number, and the committee did a great job um, in representing all of those and taking that into account. And we also wanted to make sure we were being good stewards of taxpayer dollars and the facilities to make sure that we were maximizing them um, to offer reasonable solutions for the district. So this committee has met a total of six times, and they have reviewed 26 potential scenarios. So they have been hard at work. Um, the committee began with five scenarios that the district um, laid out as a starting point. Um, and then we received various submissions by committee members um, as they um, received information, um, but also through com uh, community members. We had an online feedback process, and community members were allowed to submit um, scenarios as well. So the committee has narrowed down their recommendation to three scenarios. There are um, charts in the back um, for those of you who are in the audience and board members you have them in front of you as well. And really in narrowing down to these three scenarios um, these were the major factors um, that they looked at um, that were given to you again in November um, about capacity of our campuses, um, but ultimately what's best for kids and what's best for families. All right, so as we look at these scenarios, it's important to consider there's about 10,000 students um, that attend school in the Woodlands and the College Park feeder zones um, in, uh, from K through six. So kind of keep that number in mind as you look at those. Um, scenario in, uh, A impacts um, 702 students out of the approximate 10,000 students we um, spoke about, so about 7% of students. This scenario takes um, Jacobs Reserve and it moves the entire community from Wright Elementary to Gladys Elementary. And um, Jacobs was very vocal about wanting to stay together as a community. So we made sure that we um, considered that in making those recommendations. Um, Jacobs is right up there. See right, right about there. Um, we also, uh, looked at moving Lakeland and North Line Oaks, which is in the yellow, and a very small commercial area, which doesn't currently have any students attend, attending from that area, but we know that developers can sometimes um, do creative things on sites we don't think Dr. Winkle, can have this built This Carriage out. Hills next door to it, right? I'm sorry? Carriage Hills to Jacobs yes. Reserve. Yes. Zone, Carriage, is, zone the same? No. Carriage no. Hills has oh, not no. changed. Um, this also takes, um, uh, again, Lakeland and North Line Oaks in that commercial area from Lamar to Ride. If you're familiar with the area, Lakeland is accessible through 45 off Hope Road, but there's also a back way to Gosling Road um, that is an easy commute to Ride Elementary. It also takes 92F, 92J, and H92, which is right down there at the bottom and changes those students from Gladys Elementary to Tuff. And that would in turn change their fifth and sixth grade campus as well from Mitchell to Tuff. And then it changes 92A and 75J um, to um, from Bush Elementary to Buckaloo. And that's right there at the top. The river's edge is the development that has not been built out yet, but we do anticipate homes coming up soon in that area. Scenario B, again, um, as we look at Jacobs Reserve, um, Jacobs, when it first started, was zoned to Ride because there was room at Ride Elementary. It was a natural place to put um, those students. But as Jacobs has developed and become a thriving community, um, there's about 350 of the 750 students at Ride that live in the Jacobs area. So so Jacobs is gone. Which scenario are we on? We on B, On right? scenario B. So mm -hmm. they'll go from in B, Jacobs goes from Ride, Ride to, to Bush. Bush. Mm -hmm. And so Bush will, Bush will break off, and those kids will break off similar to Powell. And they'll go to Collins and then um, Mitchell. 
yes, we would not change any of their, their secondary or right. their current intermediate unless they were moved to a, fifth, a, a K through six campus, um, Darichen or Tuff. But currently all of Bush goes to Mitchell. 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 Mm -hmm. In this scenario. They would still go to, uh, they would go, Jacobs would go to Collins. They would right. still follow their, their natural what intermediate. What you'll see in the three scenarios is that one of our elementaries, whether it's Gladys it's or Bush, is going to be a split, split like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what you're That's what using. I was saying. Okay, I'm on the same page with you. Okay. Did you did you mention which one you're recommending yet? Or that's, that's no. We that's have not made one. a recommendation at this point. Um, we're bringing these three scenarios to you for information only. Um, we're going to start the community feedback process starting tomorrow night. Okay. And so we just wanted to give you the information what we're presenting to the community. Thank you. Um, this again takes uh, the Lakeland and North Line Oaks area here in the yellow from Lamar to Wright Elementary and the 92A area um, to, from Bush to Buckaloo mm -hmm. Elementary. And that's about 57 kids. And the um, 84C, which is this area in purple um, right here from Powell Elementary. In this area, they go to Powell, but they go to the uh, Woodlands High School. So after Powell, they go to Mitchell, they go to McCullough, they go to the Woodlands High School. Um, so this moves them to Gladys, which would not change any of their um, moving up. As they move up, they would still go to Mitchell and McCullough and the Woodlands High School. Um, 75J 80 and 83, all of the 83s, which is up here in pink, um, would move from Bush to Darichin. And so to speak to your um, comment earlier, Mr. Williams, um, those students would change from Mitchell. They would finish out at Darichin if we um, did this scenario. When they moved to Bush to Darichin, instead of going to Mitchell, they would finish fifth and sixth grade at Darichin. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I was more thinking in terms of Bush now being a, or Gladys mm -hmm. being a, Split. Kind of a hybrid as far as their next. Step. Yes, and we may have to look at more split elementary schools as we you know work through you know some of these processes. I have a, I have a quick question about mm -hmm. that. Would, somebody probably can answer. How, how is uh, the bus route from <coughs> the pink is Foster's? Yes, it's Foster's and Rivers Edge. Okay, is the bus route 1488 to 2978 and back around, or is it cut through Gosling or or? Or we had transportation run it, and we did not do 2978 to that road right there, which is Ken Lakes. Um, we ran it through Gosling and Kirkendall, and it was about 40 minutes. It's a long drive. Mm -hmm. That's one of the negatives against Scenario B is that that pink area is a pretty good drive. It's a pretty good drive just to get back to 1488. That's mm -hmm. right. So that they have a long drive wherever they go to school. And, and which scenario does not send them to dirt? I'm um, scenario A and area C. A and C. A and C. A and C. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I was thinking of 1488 right hey, as well. So now, one other question I have, and I'm sorry, the map's too small. I, I really have. I know. I, I tried schools, to get as big as I could. Tell. When you when you switch somebody from Ride to Gladys, who lives on the north side of 1488, you made their commute shorter, correct? Mm hmm. A little bit. I mean, just a little bit, but mm -hmm. short, right? So we're not jumping over the top. Of... How about to Bush, the other option? Short Bush a, a or little, Gladys, yeah, a either one. Yeah, or just a little bit. For north of 14 right? Yes, and we have the <laughs> mileage for all of those if you'd like to see the mileage. But, Oh, yeah. The map was just too small. I just couldn't. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and again, this moves uh, Rivers Edge, um, Foster's Ridge. They would um, do fifth and sixth grade at Mitchell. I mean, uh, not Mitchell, but at Darichin. And then finally, Scenario C. Scenario C moves Jacobs from Ride to Gladys. And again, that is a little bit shorter of a drive. Um, that yellow area from Lamar to Ride. Um, and moves River's Edge um, to Buckaloo Elementary. And um, down here um, at the bottom in the green, you can see um, this particular area. It would move them from Gladys to Colson Tuff. And these students actually years ago um, attended Colson Tuff. And they would finish out at Colson Tuff rather than going to Mitchell. <laughs> 
was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, if you look at each of the scenarios um, and you look at the impact on students, um, uh, scenario A impacts 702 students out of the 10,000. Scenario B um, impacts 746 students, and scenario C impacts 790 students. So as we spoke about earlier, the next part of this process is taking these three scenarios for community input and feedback um, to the public. So we will begin tomorrow evening at Knox Junior High from 6 to 8. Our committee members um, will attend as well. We will show these scenarios to the public and get their feedback. We will again open up this discussion and feedback at McCullough. Um, on Friday at noon. We try to make sure that there were different times in there. And then again, the following Monday at the Woodlands High School. Um, in addition to this, um, this will be open up on our website. Um, I'm sure tomorrow morning sure. we'll start getting um, feedback because we posted it um, this evening um, for parents to start making um, feedback and community to offer their comments. We will take that back to the committee and then a final recommendation will come to you in February. Have any of these numbers been factored into the full day pre-K? Just for instance, I'm looking at scenario A, quick math in my head, looks like Gladys under scenario A might increase around 135 kids. Would that, have those numbers been calculated into, oh, we didn't project portables at this campus, but if we do this now we will, or now we'll need more? Right. What the plan is, is after we um, have decided on a scenario, is to be able to look at where we have capacity for our pre-K programs. Right now we have a pre-K program at Powell, and so we will look at Powell Elementary to determine if that's where we still wanted to keep that program and where we had open seats to make sure that we were utilizing our campuses. I was just trying to synthesize across yeah, presentation a great, from 45 minutes ago. It's a great question. And one of the in all of these scenarios, ride will drop down significantly. And because it's a very mm -hmm. central location, it's certainly one that we're looking at is centralizing some pre uh, full day pre K at ride or possibly moving another program. But um, because there are other pieces at work, things like full day pre K or our bilingual program or some of our special needs programs are all kind of waiting to see the outcome and then we can decide to move those to make room. We have a couple of schools that are, we would like to tweak under these Lamar changes, for example, we're, we're really not moving as many students as we would like. Uh, so we wanna look at, at their programs to see if there's more we can move programmatically as opposed to zoning. Uh, the same thing with uh, Glenlock. Glenlock is right at about 102%. They're doing really well. Full day pre-K is gonna bring their numbers up again so we're going to get, we're going to look at Glenlock programmatically to see if we can solve their Powell's the same way they're right at capacity. And we want to look at programs there to see if, if we don't change anything on zoning. One of those scenarios brought out a few students from, from Powell. But if we didn't, we would want to look at programs there to see if we can make a little bit of space. And we have that advantage based on, we won't, we won't do that step until we finish this step. So this still might require some further tweaks to the earlier pre-K program presentation mm -hmm. we heard earlier. Right. Okay. Okay, this, this may be too many uh, different variables, okay, but I remember I've been on the board riding <laughs> empty one day, okay, and now it's full, and we're doing a big shift, 700 plus kids, okay, let's just say that that happened, okay, and some of these kids or families that have been moved from Gladys to Buckaloo, you know, Buckaloo to Bush or whatever they were, I mean, you know, here we go the other way. And it may not be the same exact family. It may not even be the same exact neighborhood, but there were movement from those schools the other way, okay? Is there any forecast in our demographics that says this community, therefore this school, this part of a community, in the case of the Woodlands, or this school is going to see a dramatic, you know, that it's, it's aging out of young kids or whatever? Do we have any of that that we can get out ahead of this time and not... When we take a bunch of kids out of ride, this time, and I'm not saying that we don't need to, I'm just simply saying, are we going to end up with ride or bush or buckle or whoever empty? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a great question. <clears throat> a couple of things I'm going to say. First of all, I, I want to say that last rezoning, and you know, we did it 10 years ago, I'm going to call that a resounding success because we lasted <laughs> 10 years under what we came out with without building another campus. Um, and that's really what we've been doing. We've been shuffling 
demographics to meet our student demands while we haven't built a school. And so just to go back in time, there was a time when Derrickson and Tuff were overflowing. We needed to, to bring down enrollment. We did. We moved up. Uh, s several of these same neighborhoods are in the mix again. Those three that are west of Kirkendall that go to Galatis used to go to Tuff. There's a section in, I think it was scenario C, that is zoned from Tuff to Derrickson. It represents a lot of kids. It's a very small area. It's very close physically to Tuff. They used to go to Derrickson. We would be pushing them back. And um, those are impactful. Now, we'll say we we could be impacting the same family. It will not be the same children. Right? They would have gone through uh, the grades. Um, it is a reality. Um, it is. We do try to look at the forecast. It's part of what we're trying to do with Bush, for example. We know there's growth coming on that 1488 corridor. There's a lot of growth up there. Uh, we do not have a school in that area at this time. And if we build one in the future, let's say we do it six years from now or seven years from now, we will have to rezone again. And uh, so it, there's a lot of movement, but we do know that neighborhoods go through uh, growth and they shrink. Uh, Jacobs Reserve, and I was looking at it the other day, their peak enrollment is 10th grade. So they, they've hit peak enrollment with 10th graders and they've been basically pretty flat ever since. Uh, at some point, they'll probably decline a little bit, and then they'll level off, and then they may even increase. But we do see neighborhoods that go through all those stages, where they grow fast, they drop fast, um, depending on whether the neighborhood turns over or whether or not people age in place, changes a lot of things. We've seen some changes over the years with our, uh, the number of students we're getting in density from apartment complexes, which has made it difficult to plan, because we used to get this many, now we get this many, and so it's changed. So. There continues to be, we've seen the I-45 corridor and the 148 corridor and the 242 corridors have all become more densely populated and that's impacted as we respond trying to move and take advantage of where we have room. And so I would say, yes, we did that 10 years ago. Uh, it was it was quite an undertaking and I do remember it very well. I still have bruises and scars <laughs> from it. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, this has some of those almost things in reverse. Uh, not everything, not not to that magnitude, but some of those same elements are in play. Um, but you can kind of see the themes emerging. We've we've got growth on the north side, we've got space on the west side, and we're trying to move some students one way or the other to try to make some room and take advantage of the capacity that we have in place. Um, and Ride is one of those when when Jake when when Harper's Landing outgrew Ride, they were moved to Powell, and that's what created that big opening. At the time that Jacobs Reserve was being developed, we were pretty set with our, our, we try, our goal is not to move people. Our goal is to get it and leave it alone. And we tried, and that's certainly, I think it, in, in kind of sharing some of the, the discussions with this committee, a lot of these three plans are all based on trying to achieve the results by moving the least number of students possible. Um, and there are different ways you can go about it. You can drive this way or drive that way. But I think at the end of the day, it's about getting to where there's room. And right now, there's a little bit of room in Gladys, not a lot. There's some room at Derrickson, and there's some room at Tuff, and those are the ones that we're probably uh, looking to move towards. And to get there, it's about that shuffle uh, that you mentioned, Mr. Husband's, about you know, whether it pushes some students from Bush to Buckaloo or Buckaloo down to Derrickson. It, you know, one thing I'll point out, too, about the discussions, this may not be a 10-year solution, but what we can do and what we try to anticipate is not making a move that we have to undo. So, for example, there's a little section that goes to Buckaloo, north of Derrickson. They used to go to Derrickson. We pushed them up to Buckaloo 10 years ago to make some room at Derrickson. We may not move that section now because we don't have to, but three years from now, four years, we might have to, and they would be the ones. So there's several issues that have been in play that may not be moved really as a result of buying time for those families to stay in their feeders as long as possible. But at some point, we may have to look at making those adjustments. And, and, and the other thing I would say is, you know, have room at Derrickson right now, okay? Yes, and if I'm not mistaken, two of the scenarios, uh, well, no, just one of the scenarios, the one that affects the least kids doesn't do anything to fill that gap. Yeah. And, and that's what you're saying. You don't have to do it right now, but you could or whatever. You could. Like there's that section that there's that section that goes to Tuff that has a lot of students that but, if Tuff got too full, we would move that to Derrickson. Or we've also talked about moving some programs to Derrickson 
Absolutely. So, no. so the other thing is, is I, I understand the least number of kids affected, in at least in theory, would be best. But when we look at moving a group that's way far away to fix the problem, what, you know, when we first started talking about the, I mean, you know, when we first started talking about this adjustment, okay, uh, it was the such a discussion and all that stuff. We were talking about an entire shift. And are we not just leaving ourselves wide open for not, is the Derrickson thing going to get worse? You know, or and, and can we address it now, even though it affects more kids now, do a one-time shift and put whatever group is closer to fill that void? I mean, I'm just asking. That's a great question, and I think it's... Those are exactly the kind of discussions that the committee is having. I'm, you know, sure, I think they're, they're, I'm sure y'all doing that. There, there is a, there's that pro and con of do you move everybody now or do you wait and move who you got to move and then move the next group if we need to. Um, and certainly, you know, I feel we, we will feel like whatever we accomplish, we will solve for our main problems now. And at the same time, we, we, we will not intentionally anyway, do something that we have to undo anytime soon, but it may be a half measure to get well, us closer. I know I haven't studied this as much as y'all have, and I certainly don't, <laughs> but, but what what I'm trying to say is I'm not for moving kids that are way far away, okay, I, around, okay? I hear you. Even if somebody's got to move today that doesn't have to move or, or whatever, I mean, do the shift one time I so that in the last 10 years, because y'all did an excellent job. I didn't mean to no, bring into question your what you did, but now, now that we're going back the other way, the original question that I asked was, do you see this happening? Well, you've already seen it happening there, right? And uh, But is there another school coming along that's going to blindside, oh, well, we didn't see that, and here it goes, you know, uh, aging out or whatever you call it, hadn't turned over yet. To younger family, and and that's the reason. No, I'm it's a, the it's a great one, and it's one that I will I will say that has been discussed, particularly about the idea. And I know what you're referring to in the one map where we drive everybody um, around when there are neighborhoods just to the north that we can move down and move down, and it makes for a better drive for everybody. And I, and that's why. But certainly, part of this brainstorming process and going through it, we've created different options and scenarios to look at. Uh, one of the, you know, we received one that, that uh, we didn't take forward, but I think it just said, well, let's just take the kids at Jacobs and drive them to Derrickson. You know, and then we started going, wait a second, you know, they'd be going to junior high way over here, elementary way over here, high school way over here. Um, and then we would have to go back and rezone all the intermediates. And then it was like, well, let's keep them at the intermediate middle. Then that, now they're bouncing. Why would you go to school four years and leave for the last two? So. Lots of scenarios have been brainstormed oh, sure. and been looked at, and we've tried oh, sure. to say, you know, we'll, yeah, this is a good one. We'll trust the process, and we'll wait to see what you guys bring back for us or reckon for approval, and we'll go from there. Thank you. That worked. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you gentlemen. Job. All right, item um, 4G, consider and approve the selection of construction manager at risk for Runyon, Wilkerson, and Collins. Mr. Foster. <laughs> Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Nall. It's my privilege to bring forward for your consideration and approval a selection of a construction manager at risk for our Runyon, Wilkerson, and Collins PE classroom additions projects, and then authorize our superintendent, Dr. Nall, to negotiate and execute the construction manager at risk contracts. So this project is, is a result of our 2019 bond referendum that passed in November. DLR Group is our architect for this job. They helped us by helping to prepare a request for qualifications, which our purchasing department then published for us. We had four companies respond to our RFQ. All four companies were invited to participate in the second step of our two-step selection process. And following the pricing and interviewing, our committee ranked the proposals. I'd like to say we make the ranking as part of our item as well. And at this time, we request your approval to select GTT general contractors as the offerer who we feel submitted the proposal determined to be the best value for the district. This time. Second. Motion second and discussion? On one question. How long do we anticipate projects lasting? 
So we've got these projects scheduled uh, so annually. So we're going to start at Runyon, at least that's our current plan, because uh, they're most affected by the pre-K uh, yes. uh, mandate. Oh, yeah. So having a, a dedicated gym space is going to help them uh, greatly. So we're trying to w work through the design process now so we can start working this summer at Runyon. Then we'll work there for eight or nine months. And as that project's wrapping up, we'll be unfolding the project for uh, Wilkerson and then moving on to, uh, to okay, Collins. So it's eight or nine months to complete each school? In, yes, sir. And so we're talking about three different schools here. Yes, sir. So, so the the whole two and a half uh, or three years. Correct. I mean, so we'll but we'll be we'll be doing construction at one campus at a time. So in in right. theory, we're getting better as we go, uh, oh, so okay. that we can take we can learn lessons from one and apply them to the second and the third. Okay. I think they're all greatly needed, and I'm I'm glad we're getting them done. I agree. Just wish we could get them done quicker. I know. All right. Motion second. Um, discussion. All in favor. Motion passes, thank you. Mr. Foster, Mr. Foster, I, item 4I, consider acceptance of 2017 life cycle project. Oh, we have H first. We're on H. Oh, God, I almost, I'm trying to get through it fast. <laughs> <laughs> consider an approved selection of construction manager at risk for Conroe High, master plan phase two, Mr. Foster. Again, this is uh, an item for your consideration wow. and approval, a selection of a construction manager at risk for our Conroe High School master plan phase two project, which will continue and ultimately complete the work that we've got planned for uh, Connor High School. So as this project is again as a result of our 2019 bond referendum that passed in November, our, our architect PBK helped us by working with us to prepare the RFQ. And then again, it was published by our purchasing department. We had three firms uh, respond to this RFQ. We, re we requested all three firms to participate in the second step of the two-step selection process. And just like before, we made the rankings uh, uh, part of the item as well. Uh, after reviewing the pricing in the interview process, our committee uh, feels that Ellisor Constructors is the best value as they presented for the district, and we're requesting your approval so and selection. Second. Discussion. I do have one question for you. Um, if I remember correctly, Ellisor was uh, phase one at Connor High School? Yes, sir. All right, and, and I noticed that they scored substantially higher on the proposed personnel on your rubric there. Are they going to be able to keep some of their same personnel as far as PMs, supers, and stuff on this? Absolutely. They, they propose the, the same staff that's been successful at Connor High School for phase one. Yeah. Thank you. That was the same question I was going to ask. All right. Thank you. All in favor? Pass. Um, let's go for I consider acceptance of 2017 life cycle project. Mr. Foster. All right, see, as this is an item that uh, to accept a project is complete. So as you recall, our local policy requires all projects over $1 million to be brought in front of you for their final acceptance. So our life cycle project, as you know, is a project that's right. replacing building systems that have reached the end of their useful life. Uh, life cycle 17 had a contract value of $8,167,886. We're having a report we right. are returning a savings to the district at the completion of that project of $77,000. $984.08. At this point, we are requesting your approval to accept the project as complete. Move. Second. Motion second. second. All in favor? Motion passes. It's time you're saving us money. That's great. Uh, item 4J, consider acceptance of Clark Intermediate Construction uh, Project. Mr. Foster. Yes, sir. And just like the uh, item before, this is to accept Clark Intermediate, which we contracted as Flex School number 18, as complete. So we had original contract value of $24,491,428 or $25,491,428. At the completion of this project, we're returning uh, savings and unspent allowances and contingencies of $581,823.26. At this time, we're requesting your approval to accept the project as complete. So we'll move. Accept. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Passes. Thank you, Mr. Foster. All right, item 4K, receive capital improvement updates. Mr. Foster, seems like you gave us an update on every school we have. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it, it is my pleasure to bring you updates on our capital improvements we have underway throughout the district, and this time I only have one for you. Yeah, all right. So Stockton Junior High School is the final project of the 2015 bond referendum to uh, that has yet to achieve substantial completion. I like to report it is on schedule, so it's scheduled to open in August of 2020, as you've heard from all of our other presentations earlier this evening. So you can see from our aerial view, the, the ball field is looking mighty nice. The solar panels are producing power every day, uh, just as we had anticipated. So we're working through the finer details with Intergy on that calculation on making sure they're returning what we 
had hoped we would on our investment. Uh, the, the big goal, as we've been saying over the last several months, is getting the building to a dry state. So it's hard to see from this angle, but there's more and more glass going in the window frames every day. As you can see from the front, the reflections on some of those images, that is the glass going in. We started this week, or actually last week, working through the process of uh, flushing the air conditioning system, the piping, and all the other systems so we can get ready to start up that building and bring it into a conditioned environment. And that process will happen basically over the next month or so as we get more and more glass and close that building up. So on the inside, we're working on finishes and classrooms and ceiling grid and casework and all the other things that make that uh, building come to life. And so, like I said before, it is on schedule. We're happy to report that it will open for students in August of 2020. And that is our update. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Outstanding. All right, item five, business and finance. Consider award of CSP 19-1001, maintenance and repair. Mr. No, Dr. All Rick. right, Mr. Rick Reeves. All right, Mr. Reeves, you're up. Dr. Reeves. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Tonight we are recommending that the board award CSP 19-10-01 maintenance, repair, and operations job order contract program to the vendors notated for an estimated annual expenditure of $1 million. Competitive sale proposals pertain to the district's maintenance, repair, and operations job order contract program or email to register vendors through the district's electronic e-bidding system and advertising the courier. Vendors were asked to bid their adjustment factors based on the Gordian Group maintenance, repair, and operations task catalog. Uh, which contains our maintenance, repair, and operations tasks with preset unit prices. Adjustment factor pricing will remain firm through January 31st, 2021, renewing annually with four optional one-year terms through January 31st, 2025. Best value offers are recommended for award, and at this time, we request your approval. So moved. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion, gentlemen? Uh, all in favor? Motion passes. Outstanding. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Um, item 5B, consider approval of 2018-2019 CAFR. All right, Mr. Rice. Yes, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to recommend that the board approve the 2018-2019 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, better known as the CAFR. First, I'd like to recognize the finance staff that is here this evening that are very instrumental in preparation of the CAFR, Ms. Janice Cyrus and Karen Garza. Outstanding. Great job. Sarah Roberts, partner with Weaver and Tidwell, presented a detailed review of the CAFR to the district's audit committee on Wednesday, January 8th. The audit committee voted to recommend the CAFR to the full board for its approval. Sarah Roberts is here this evening with a condensed presentation of the CAFR and can answer any questions that you may have. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Darren. So I'm here to um, briefly present to you the results of our audit. I was here a couple of weeks ago um, and met with the, the audit committee and saw many of you then. Um, just backing up a little bit, a brief overview of our um, audit timeline. We started our initial planning in May and ultimately wrapped up our field work in December. Um, and while we may not always be on site out here at your offices, we are um, available year round and remain um, in communication with your finance department and we're always just an email or call away. We conducted a, uh, the type of audit for Conroe Independent School District is called a single audit and that included an audit of the financial statements and an audit of federal awards. At the conclusion of our audit, we issued three reports the first two pertain to the financial statement audit, and that's our auditor's report on the financial statements and our yellow book report on internal controls and compliance. The third report is our uniform guidance report um, related to federal awards, uh, compliance, and inter internal controls over compliance. So those are the three reports that we issued. Um, I'll now go into the types of reports that we issued. First, on the financial statements, we issued an unmodified opinion which is a clean opinion, which is the highest level of assurance we can give that the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with United States generally accepted accounting <coughs> principles. On our yellow book, yellow book report, we identified no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies, and no compliance items that were material to the financial statements. Lastly, our uniform guidance report on federal awards we issued an unmodified opinion here as well, and no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal controls over compliance, 
and no other audit findings that are required to be reported in accordance with the uniform guidance. Our major program this year was a special education cluster, which covered about 25% of federal expenditures. Last year, our major programs were um, Title I, Child Nutrition, and the Hurricane Recovery Grants. And this coming cycle, I anticipate we'll be taking a look at Title, um, title I again. That's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a question for you real quick. I know that, um, that you obviously are given guidelines on what it is that you're looking for. My, my question is with, with Weaver, with your firm, do you also go any farther with best practice things that we should be doing or do you look at as well that are not necessarily required in the audit but that you guys add to that as well just to make sure that we're even above board on, on what the, the, um, the audit is requiring? We do, and that's actually not required under our auditing standards, right. but it's part of every one of our audits, and we work closely with your finance department to uh, first gain an understanding for our own purposes of your internal controls, um, to look for control weaknesses. Um, I spoke about material weaknesses or significant deficiencies, but we're also looking to identify general deficiencies in internal controls that may not rise to that level, and if we, ha we do identify any, we talk to your finance department about them. Um, and we always do look for opportunities to improvement, and we 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 want to be more of just a auditor, um, more of a client service focus. So we we do um, take that into account as a standard practice. Great, thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a motion from Mr. Husbands to adopt. Unless I'm cutting you off. No, no, we, no I was just recommend your approval. Sure deal. And Mr. Sanders a second. Oh, any discussion? All, all, all in favor? <laughs> Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Null? Yes. This meeting of the Conroe ISD Board of Trustees is convened on January 21st, 2020. A quorum of the board is present, including the following members, Mr. Moore, Mr. Husbands, Mr. Williams, Mr. Hubert, and Mr. Sanders. The board will hear the complaint appeal of former CISD employee Donald Grant in accordance with local policy DGBA. The hearing is being recorded. Mr. Grant's complaint is against officers in the district's police department. Because the complaint is against district employees, the hearing will be held in closed session pursuant to Texas Government Code Sections 551.074 and 552.082. The board will also go into executive session under Texas Government Code Section 551.071 for consultation with the board's attorney. The meeting is now adjourned to executive session under Texas Government Code Section 551.071, 551.074 and 551.082. Everyone not associated with this hearing should leave the room. The board will take no action while in executive session. The time is now 8.03. We will take a 10 minute recess before reconvening. Thank you. The, more, the board is now reconvened in open session. The time is now 8.44. The board will now make its decision. The board can uphold the decisions of the level one and level two hearing officers. The board can overturn the hearing officers' decisions, or the board can grant any relief that they feel is appropriate. Is there a motion? Mr. President, I move that we uphold the decisions of the level one and the level two hearing officers and deny all relief requested. Is there a second? I second the motion. Second. All right. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? No. Oh. Mr. Grant, um, the board has upheld the level one and level two hearing officers decisions. Um, the, the district will send you written notice confirming this action that, that has been taken. Okay. Thank you. And this concludes our hearing, Mr. President. All right. We're back in session, 845. Um, gentlemen, that's it. Can I get a motion to, so, we have a adjourn. motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Mr. Morris. Yeah. Adjourn. Thank you.